This is an interview with Dr. Lethford on January 10th, conducted at Congregation Beth Israel. The interviewer is... You? Is, oh, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Emmy? Charlie? Um, when and where were you born? I was actually born in New York City. My parents were living in Greenville at the time, but um, Greenville in the 40s was a pretty awful place. And when my mother was pregnant with me, she panicked and wanted to be back with her family in New York. So I was actually born in Brooklyn. But when I was a month old, we came back here and I grew up in Greenville. Um, when did your family first come to America? Uh, well, my parents uh, came for here from Europe as children. My mother was born in Minsk, and she came to America, I think, around 1920. Uh, my father was born in a little village in Poland, and he came here as a child in 1912. And yeah, my father said he married up, because he came from a, his family had a house with a dirt floor. My mother's family had a wood floor, <laughs> and they owned a goat, their own goat. So. Oh, when did your family arrive in South Carolina? Um, my father came to Greenville in 1928 because uh, one of his cousins decided to build a shirt factory here, uh, the Piedmont Shirt Company, and offered him a job. So he came down in 1928. And then uh, he met my mother on a trip back to New York and brought her, married her and brought her down here in 1940. Um, why did... wait... Why did they come to South Carolina? Well, my father came for the job. Nobody would come to South Carolina for any other reason in those days. <laughs> Was anyone in your family a pioneer? That is, the first Jewish person in the community? Uh, no, not really the first. I mean, it was a very small Jewish community when they came here, but no, they weren't really pioneers. Describe the various professions, businesses, or jobs family members have engaged in as far back as is known. Well, actually, you know, Greenville in the 40s and 50s, uh, there were no professionals. There were no Jewish professionals at all. Uh, the only Jews really in Greenville either had retail stores on Main Street or else they, they came here because of the textile and apparel industry. There were no Jewish doctors, lawyers, architects, teachers. That, that was really unknown until well into the 60s. On a map, were, the bu were their businesses located? Uh, really, all of them on Main Street. There must at one point, I think in the 50s, there were probably 15 or 16 Jewish stores on Main Street. Uh, the only one left now really is the Greenville Army and Navy store that Jeff Zaglin has on, at the southern end of Main Street. Where were other important Jewish structures or businesses? Uh, well, the only important Jewish structures, um, the old Beth Israel Synagogue, of course, is on town, near the corner of Town Street and Park Avenue, and that was built in the 1920s. And the Temple of Israel, actually their first place was on Buist Avenue off North Main Street, and that was also built in the 1920s. Do you have a family tree? I think I assume everybody does. <laughs> uh, well, my own family, just myself and my sister, she lives in New York. Do you have photographs or portraits of your forebears? Uh, yes, I do, actually. Yeah. In fact, I brought them. I don't know if you can get them in on this. So. Fam yeah, go ahead and show them. Oh, well, okay. Uh, well, some of, the, some of the old pictures. Uh, this is my mother's father. This is his naturalization certificate when he became a citizen in 1930. Uh, I don't know if I have any of the others here. Um, well, these, these were my parents, probably in their 30s or, or 40s, my, my father and mother. And let's see. This here actually was taken in the 19, 
uh, 20s. This is actually a uh, socialist organization my father belonged to in New York. In fact, it's still there. In Yiddish, it's called the Arbiter Ring, the Workman's Circle. And it was the main Jewish group of socialists in New York in those years. Mm -hmm. And this was, this was taken in the 20s, I think, late 20s, before he came to Greenville. Yeah. The lettering in the front here is in Yiddish. Um, let's see. I think if I have some of the old... Uh, this, I don't know what the occasion was. This is the mayor's office in Greenville in the 1940s. And there was some official occasion you know, involving Beth Israel. I don't know really what it was. Uh, but you can see a lot of the uh, older members of Beth Israel are here in this picture. That, in fact, if you recognize, was Max Heller in the back row when he was probably about uh, 35 or 40. Uh, let's see. Well, actually, this is just sentimental. That's my mother and me. Okay. And let's see. Uh, there is one of my parents and Max and Trudy Heller at some sort of Beth Israel function. I don't remember which one it was. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, this is actually my sister having her bat mitzvah at the old synagogue on Town Street. Your sister had a bat mitzvah? One of the first ones to have. Yeah, she was one. I think maybe the second or third girl to have them. They didn't start till the mid 1950s, letting girls have bat mitzvahs. No, that they had real bat mitzvahs, you know, with, with the off Torah reading. But not the Torah. Uh, I don't so think they were they read Torah. No. Um, this is one of the oldest pictures of the Beth Israel sisterhood. This I think is back from the 1940s, and actually it was in the Greenville News. So there, this is a corresponding thing from the news, which I, actually identifies which woman is which in the thing there. Um, this is one of my parents with uh, High and Ruth Chambers. That must be back from the early 1940s. And that's actually, I think, my mother and Barbara Shimlock in the, in the kitchen over here when it was first built. What was it like growing up Jewish in Greenville? Very strange, actually. <laughs> Greenville, in the 40s and 50s, Greenville was a very homogeneous place. Um, there was um, the Temple of Israel had maybe 50 or 60 members, Beth Israel maybe 80 or 90. Uh, there was one Catholic church in the entire Greenville area, no mosques. Um, Bob Jones really was the major religious institution in those years. It had much more influence than it has now. And essentially, uh, everyone was assumed to be a Baptist until proved otherwise. And uh, in, in, in school, actually it was kind of nice. I got a very good Christian education. Every day, from really from elementary school all the way through high school, we started the day by the Pledge of Allegiance, and then we all said the Lord's Prayer. And then the teacher would read a few verses from the, uh, from the New Testament. Uh, which actually, I didn't really mind. I mean, I learned a lot about Christianity. I never felt less Jewish. Uh, but it really, um, uh, yeah, anyone who was not a Baptist in Greenville in those days really felt, really felt different. You know, diversity was not a virtue in those days. Do you think it's still that way to some degree? Uh, maybe to some degree, but not nearly as much. I mean, if you had told anybody when I was a kid that Greenville would have two mosques someday, they, you know, that, that would have been insane. Nobody could imagine it. Where, did you have any Jewish friends growing up, or were you the only one? No, no, we, we had, uh, in fact, most Jews socialized with each other in those days. Really? They didn't have many non-Jewish friends. Uh, there were so few of us, though, that to have a youth group, we actually combined our youth group with Spartanburg and Asheville. There was a combined youth group for the three cities, and we used to alternate going to different things in different cities. There weren't enough kids in Greenville to have a youth group on our own. So did you, one of the things that we're interested in as a religious school is your peers. You know, 
did you, when you say youth group, was that after Hebrew school or was that your Hebrew school also? Well, in, in Hebrew school also, it was very small, but the Jewish community was very, very close-knit. Um, partly because it was biologically close-knit. The, the founding families from around the World War I era, when there first began to be a Jewish community, uh, were basically either Zaglins, Lurie's, or Davis's. <laughs> and I remember talking to Ann Lurie. I wish she could have been here this morning. She knows the history better than I do. She said at one point in, uh, in the 1940s, she was actually personally related to almost everybody at Beth Israel, <laughs> except for about a dozen people. So it literally was a family. <laughs> My parents and the Hellers were almost the only ones who weren't actually biologically related you know, to the other Jewish families. Can you talk a little bit about how the synagogue was the center of your cultural and your social experience? Well, it was because uh, Jew those Jews in those days didn't have many non-Jewish friends. Uh, intermarriage was still pretty, a pretty exotic thing. Uh, there were many places, like the only two decent restaurants in Greenville in the 40s were the Country Club on Bird Boulevard and the Poinsett Club, and Jews weren't allowed in either one in those years. So there weren't many places to go. I mean, there was no center stage, there was no warehouse theater, the Greenville Symphony was really awful in those years. Um, the Little Theater was about the only place, and there were no decent restaurants at all. Um, and so basically, uh, at Friday night services, we would get 50, 60, 70 people. But it was really, it was nothing religious. I mean, these were not religious people. It was just kind of an ethnic solidarity rally <laughs> when the congregations all got together. And did you celebrate holidays together? Did you have a Passover Seder here, or did you have one in different people's houses where the community came together? No, it was all. It was uh, always done at home. We didn't have uh, community seders in those days. Yeah, the the first rabbi who came. Well, I'm not really sure he was an ordained rabbi, but he was the first rabbi. Was a man named Charles Zaglin, who was Jeff Zaglin's grandfather, actually. And he came here from t somewhere in Tennessee in 1911. And I think he was, all, he was also the shokhet, the, the kosher slaughterer for Greenville. So for several years, we actually did have a kosher slaughterer here. Um, what, did, wait, what did this synagogue look like? Well, the old synagogue on, uh, on Town Street, which is where it's now being ripped up and you know, torn down to build something else, it, it was really a very strange place. Because if you've ever seen it on town, you have stone steps that go up the front. That was the only way to get up to the second floor. There was no internal staircase. <laughs> I don't know who the architect was, whoever dreamed up a building like that. It, it was, but in order to get, if you were on the, on the top floor and wanted to get to the bottom floor, you had to go outside <laughs> and come back in. <laughs> Same from going to the bottom floor to the top floor. Uh, there was no air conditioning. <laughs> And on something like Yom Kippur, when it was packed, you know, uh, with no air conditioning in, in early September, it was, uh, we really afflicted ourselves. So we, we, we really observed the holiday. Yeah. And there was a mikvah, too. There was a mikvah. I don't think it was ever used, but there, but there actually was a mikvah. How did your family celebrate the Sabbath? Uh, that, that's an interesting thing. Um, it, it's one of the odd things about the history of Beth Israel, until 1958, it was officially calling itself an Orthodox congregation. It didn't join the United Synagogue of America, the conservative movement, until 1958, when they built this building and moved out here, which was kind of a joke because nobody kept the Sabbath, I mean, strictly in those days, mainly because everybody had a store in Main Street. You had to be open on Saturday to make a living. So, you know, no one could, could really observe it. That's why the... Um, uh, the Friday night service was such a big thing. There was no Saturday morning service. Uh, Beth Israel never had a Saturday morning service until really till Rabbi Futornik came here. She was the one who started the, uh, the Saturday morning service. When was that? Uh, she was here, gosh, it must be about 15, 20 years ago now. Really? It was recent that we had? It was that recent that we had, uh, except for an occasional bar mitzvah. That's the only time we ever had a service Saturday morning. Yeah. Which was kind of, and it really it led to a lot of problems because we would advertise for rabbis as an Orthodox congregation. And you know, an Orthodox rabbi would come down here, realize what he'd gotten into, and the average rabbi in the 40s and 50s lasted about 18 months. We went through, I don't know how many of them during that time. How did you become so knowledgeable? 
Uh, most of my interest in, in, uh, in Jewish learning really came from my father. Uh, before he left Poland to come to his family to America, he actually went to yeshiva. He, he started studying Talmud when he was eight years old. And I think he, when he was about 12, they had to leave to go to America. Uh, of course, when he got there, he became an atheist and a socialist. But, but, he, but he, never, he never lost his love of Jewish learning, and I think I got that from him. What religious holidays did your family observe? Well, all of them. I mean, uh, Friday night, we went to synagogue every Friday night. Of course, Passover, uh, Shavuot, Sukkot, the high holidays. Uh, we pretty much observed all of them. Did your family keep kosher? Uh, no, we didn't. Yeah. In fact, my, my uh, mother's uh, father, who was very, who was uh, very, very religious, uh, never forgave her for marrying my father, <laughs> who took her to a place called Greenville that nobody in New York had ever heard of, <laughs> and not letting her keep a kosher home. <laughs> Was your family concerned uh, concerned about Jewish identity? Uh, we were, but actually, in a sense, living in a place like Greenville, it really strengthened your sense of Jewish identity. It's different than living in New York City where everybody in your building is Jewish and half the people on the street are Jewish. Uh, in uh, Greenville, you were very, very aware of your identity. How did you meet your spouse when you were married? Okay. Well, actually, when I got out of medical school, I went back to New York. I, I did my, um, my, my residency in, in, in New York City, a hospital there. Uh, my wife was a nurse who was working at the same hospital. And we actually met at around 3 a.m. one morning when we were both working the night shift. <laughs> well, actually, it's funny. Well, you know, when I left Greenville, and I, I graduated from Greenville High in 58, and when I left Greenville, I knew this would be the last place in the world I would ever come back to. <laughs> I never wanted to see Greenville again. And then uh, in the 70s, when we were living out west, um, you know, I would come back about, you know, once a year to visit my parents here. And I noticed in the 70s, Greenville was actually turning into, into a real city. And then it, uh, it seemed like a nice place you know, to come back and raise a family. Um, how many children did you have? Uh, two. Have they remained in South Carolina? Yeah, I have a son who's in Columbia and a daughter who's in Charleston. Are there any intermarriages or converse, or conversions into or out of the Jewish faith in your family? Uh, not, well, yes, both, both my children intermarried. Neither of them really, um, uh, even though we tried to raise them as observant Jews, neither of them really got into it. Uh, and, they, and, they, and they both intermarried. How Jewish were your ancestors? Oh, very Jewish, but, <laughs> but that's not really saying much because they, they were in Europe. They grew up in Eastern Europe, in Poland and Russia, where there weren't any of the other options. All Jews were observant Jews there. How would you describe the relationship? relationship between Jews and Gentiles in your community? Uh, when I was growing up it was um, it really was kind of strange. Uh, <laughs> Uh, basically, uh, you know, most of, most of our Gentile neighbors really were very worried about us because we were all going to hell, obviously, <laughs> you know, not having accepted Jesus as our personal Savior. And, uh, you know, it's almost as if, you know, if you knew that the people next door weren't vaccinating their kids, I mean, you know, you'd really do everything you could to try to, you know, to show them the, the, the right way to do it. And our neighbors used to come over all the time, you know, bringing us religious pamphlets and, and Bibles and whatnot. And, and you know, it, in a sense, it was irritating. But in another sense, uh, you know, they were really doing it for the best of motives. They, they really were worried about us going to hell, and they wanted to save us. What would you say to them? How would you, how would you handle that situation? We well, just tell them, you know, we have our own religion, and we're happy with it. And... Um, uh, it, it, it's very, very difficult. Greenville is one of the few places when you come there, one of the first, even today in parts of Greenville, if you move here, the first thing your neighbors will ask you is, what church do you belong to? That's true. I mean, it's even true today. It was ten times more true back then. I think there's the highest concentration of churches in Greenville of any place. There may be. Church. 
Although, you know, to give them credit, um, uh, Bob, and, you know, back when I was a kid, uh, the before there was NPR, you know, public radio, the only radio station in Greenville where you could get classical music, because everybody else played either country music or rock and roll, was WMUU, Bob Jones. Bob Jones was the only station that played decent music, but you had to listen to the sermonettes, you know, in between, <laughs> you know, in between each thing. Have your or your family experienced or been aware of anti-Semitism? Well, there was a great deal of anti-Semitism in those days, yeah. Well, it was official anti-Semitism. Jews couldn't go to the country club. Uh, Jews couldn't go to the poinsett club. Uh, yeah, there, there definitely was. Uh, an example would be, um, you know, I, I mentioned the uh, the Army Navy store that Jeff Zaglin had on. Uh, he, that was started by his father, Harry Zaglin. And he didn't start it because he really wanted to be a retail merchant. Harry Zaglin and his brother Saul Zaglin both had engineering degrees from Georgia Tech. Wow. But nobody was hiring Jewish engineers around there then. And so they had to go into business as an alternative. Around what year was Oh, the late 1930s, early 40s, yeah. Wow. Do non-Jewish people in your community regard you as different? Oh, very different, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they could not understand how anybody could not be a Christian. I mean, they just honestly couldn't get their heads around that. Do you think of your Jew of yourself as a Jewish Southerner or a Southern Jew? As a Jewish Southerner or a Southern Jew? Probably more as a Southern Jew. <laughs> My Jewish identity comes first. In your opinion, are there special challenges to being Jewish in the South? Uh, well, there are, mainly because uh, you don't have the Jewish institutional you know, you don't have synagogues with thousands of members like you would in, you know, in the largest cities and that sort of thing. You don't have Jewish day schools. You don't have that sort of thing. Uh, but on the other hand, um, uh, you, you're much more aware of your Jewish identity, and you're really much more aware of how precarious Jewish life is in, in a place like Greenville, when you know where you have small groups of Jews that are barely hanging on. Uh, and my sister lives in Manhattan. Yeah, everybody in her building practically is Jewish. Everybody she knows is Jewish. She's totally unobservant. She doesn't even go on the high holidays. But she feels very Jewish because she's basically, you know, a, a fish swimming in a Jewish ocean. So she doesn't have to be aware of being Jewish. It's just a default option. Here you have to be aware of being Jewish. Did any of your family or other members of the Jewish community serve in the armed forces during World War II? Uh, nobody in my family did. My father had polio as a child, and so he really wasn't physically able to serve. Uh, there were a number of members of Beth Israel, though, uh, who did serve in the armed forces. Um, in fact, I think if they still have it, there's a picture out there somewhere in the lobby with pictures of all the Jewish members, you know, their armed forces photos during a World War II. Um, what were race relations like in your community during the civil rights movement of the 1960s? Uh, pretty terrible, actually. Um, Greenville was was a pretty awful place. It's uh, and not, actually, Greenville had its last lynching in 1947. It wasn't that really that far in the past. Um, when I when I went to school, of course, we went to segregated schools. I went to Greenville High, which was all white. Ster all the black kids went to Sterling. In fact, it was even segregated by class. There were, the only, there were only three high schools when I was in high school. Uh, Greenville High was for really middle and upper class whites. The lower class whites, mainly mill workers, kids went to Parker. They weren't expected to go, you know, to, go to college. And uh, of course, all the black kids went to Sterling. So you had segregation both by race and by class here. What was it like when the civil rights movement kind of swept through Greenville? When, it, when we were breaking down and sort of you know, integrating? How yeah. Well, I wasn't living in Greenville anymore in the 60s and 70s. I, I really don't have any firsthand uh, knowledge of that. What was your reaction to, 
to school desegregation? Yes. Yeah, that's what I think. Oh. Yeah. Um, well, uh, the Jews in, in Greenville, of course, obviously were backing it. But again, they kept very quiet because Jews felt themselves to be a threatened minority. And even though they sort of, they sympathized with Martin Luther King and the whole civil rights movement, they really were afraid to speak out. They, they thought they were a threatened minority themselves. Uh, the attitude really is summed up. If you saw the movie uh, Driving Miss Daisy, if you remember her son, Bully, when she asked him to come to the Martin Luther King speech, you know, with her, and he doesn't want to go because he's he's really afraid of how his business associates are going to look at him. That's and that was really the attitude of most Jews, almost all Jews in Greenville during that during that era, just keeping a low profile, even though they sympathized with it quietly. They didn't want to get out front with it. Were there any Jewish businesses that were more friendly to African Americans than? perhaps non-Jewish businesses were, or that you remember? Well, I think most Jews really were positively disposed toward blacks, but as I said, none of them took an active uh, role in the civil rights movement. The first one, really, who, uh, who I think made major progress is when Max Heller was mayor of Greenville during the 1970s, and he really went out of his way to hire blacks in his administration. Friends with anybody that you grew up in the synagogue with still? Uh, everybody really is pretty much scattered. It there, yeah. That's that's one of the things. Most I'm one of the few people who actually came back to Greenville. You know, most most people left Greenville and didn't come back. The only people that came back besides me, I think, were Jeff Zaglin, uh, Bobby Jean Rovner. You know, who stayed in Greenville, and I don't remember anyone else really who, who came back to Greenville or stayed there. When do you think Greenville started to evolve and become more Jewish friendly, I guess? Less, mm -hmm. you know what I'm trying to ask? Yeah, I think mainly no. uh, during the 70s. The 70s. And after, of course, also it, it because uh, for two reasons, the industries that came in like BMW and Michelin General Electric, you know, brought people in from different parts of the country. So you got a little bit of diversity that way. Also, Greenville became, you know, is becoming a retirement center. A lot of people, instead of going to Florida, you know, which was everybody up north went to Florida when you retired, now you go to western North Carolina or to upstate South Carolina. And so that brings a little bit more diversity into it, too. I mean, I was amazed to find out a few years ago that there's actually a Hindu temple in Simpsonville. Most of them are engineers who work for either for BMW or for Michelin. Uh, from India, and they have 400 families. Wow! They're actually as big as Temple Israel and Beth Israel put together. together. Wow. And who would have ever dreamed that a Hindu wow. temple in Simpsonville? Wow.